Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today for this live presentation. My name is Dennis Lecky. I'm the product development agronomist for the Northeast region. The focus of today's presentation will be on be on Irish potato production, and this is a CCJ way, and it will look at our pest and disease control strategies um, and identification of these pests and diseases, the major ones that affect potatoes, as well as the nutrient requirements or some of the nutrient requirements that potatoes need. Now, as you know, this is our main potato growing season and most farmers would have already done land preparation and started planting. You know, some earlier than others, with some actually starting from in as early as October. Now, there are some key things to remember and to note before planting potatoes. So, for those of you who are looking even into January for planting and further into the year and even into the next planting season, which would be next um, October. These are some key things that you must note in order to be able to really maximize your production of potatoes. A lot of farmers make mistakes in the initial stages. This is even before they have bought and planted their potatoes. They have made these mistakes and it has cost, caused them to lose money or lose income, lose production. Now the time of the year, and that is a very important factor because potatoes, in order for them to produce, for you to get the potato it is that, it, that you harvest to eat or to sell, they grow best at a certain time of the year under certain climatic conditions. Now, for tuberization to occur, which is the development of the potatoes that you would harvest and sell and consume, you need a longer night or, 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 or longer hours of night or darkness for tuberization to occur. So tuberization really occurs when you have a longer dark period. Also, you need temperatures, the cooler temperatures, because potatoes is really a cool, season crop so you need the temperatures to fall and, and and then you start to have a greater difference between your night and daytime temperatures also and you know this is for something for some of you know who are in the heavier clay soils especially some of my people who are in like saint mary and this is a major issue during this time of the year too, you also have an increase in rainfall now, once you have this increase in rainfall, if you don't have your drainage systems in ahead of time, you end up in trouble because trying to dig a drain to get the water off of your land during that rainy period is a very difficult thing to do. And sometimes by the time you dig that drain, your potatoes already start to spoil. Another important thing to look at is the acreage you want to produce. I tell farmers this all the time. It's better you do one square potato, but do it properly more than try to do an acre potato and you can't manage or can't afford to maintain the crop. Now, potatoes in and of itself, they are, it is a, it's a relatively delicate crop if your crop care is not maintained at a specific standard. I said to farmers, the ideal thing to do with potatoes is to spray for prevention more than try to cure or solve a problem. As such, even for chemicals that might have a two-week um, efficacy period, so it, you know, it would stay and work in the plant for two weeks. During this time of the year, ideally we said in many cases shorten your spray cycle to a seven-day spray cycle. And you need to really stick to that seven day spray cycle. So your acreage will determine 
you know, just about how much money, you know, you have to look at in order for you, you know, to do your land clearing, your land preparation, to purchase your seeds, to purchase fertilizer, to purchase chemicals and biostimulants, you know, to maximize your production. Your land preparation. This is one that a lot of farmers rush each year. And rushing land preparation in potatoes is a big no-no. I said to you, if it is that the potato land not prepared and ready for planting by say the end of October at the latest, you might I might have said, don't look to try plant the potatoes there again for the rest of that year. Because a lot of pests might be in that soil and when touch on one of them later in the presentation that can actually create a whole lot of havoc and you don't know that it's there and it becomes a problem during your production activities and at the time of harvesting you also have if the land is not bedded properly or the soil hasn't broken down properly once you plant your seed potatoes you know, I should come around and mold or the potatoes should start to develop because the land wasn't prepared properly. I wasn't ready to be planted. You end up with some other issues there as well, where you don't get the proper potato development, they don't get the proper shape that they're supposed to have, and you reduce your marketability. Your planting material, and this is key. I can plant supplies bamba potatoes. Um, you have other potatoes on the market and you have multiple suppliers of potatoes. But your planting material, your potato seed material is very important. And how it is presented to you, that is how you get it from the person who you buy it from. And what you do with the planting material after receiving it is important and will lead to whether you have a successful crop so for example you have persons who might bring in potatoes and they're selling it for a cheap rate but the quality of those potatoes that you get is not up to standard and what you end up with is substandard planting material that might come down and you end up having you know disease outbreaks in your field you might have the potatoes, you know, breaking down and spoiling prematurely, or you might even encounter situations where, you know, the, the, the potatoes that you have, uh, apart from being said diseased, you don't get good sprouting from the potatoes as well. Now, the other thing to look at is definitely going to be your financial ability. So what you can afford to spend versus the returns that you want, that you expect. Now, a basic potato spray program, you know, just using your regular granular fertilizers, you know, a, a little foliar fertilizers and your insecticides and fungicides might end up netting you a profit. However, a more comprehensive spray program, like the ones that are recommended by Caribbean Chemicals Jamaica, you know, our crop care guides may give you upwards of even 25% more in terms of your yield by comparison to the basic spray program. So it went, it's going to be something that you would, as the farmer, as the grower, will have to determine early out if I want to put out this extra bit of money in order to get that extra production from my field. So in terms of the environmental requirements, potatoes grow best when the temperatures are between 16 and 27 degrees, which is the kind of temperatures we're having now in Jamaica. As I mentioned earlier, sunlight, less daylight hours, and longer night time hours is more suitable. You know, in the image to the left, you can actually see 
the, 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 the fog over the field. And that is during the day, almost midday. So you know that it was pretty cold there. Your planting period is usually between October and January, if you're pushing it the end of January. But ideally, most farmers try to have their potatoes planted by the last week of December. Depending on where you are, a planting period can also take place between March and May. The planting depth. Now, this is in the furrow itself. You can do it about two, sink the potatoes about two inches deep and lightly cover with soil. And also we advise that you could actually fertilize before planting. But as they say, blind the fertilizer or cover the fertilizer before putting down the seed potato. And this is because the fertilizer itself can actually burn the seed potatoes. However, what would be ideal would be that as soon as the potato pushes out its roots, it goes down into the ground and start to find the fertilizer. And one thing we know is that fertilizer, if, if the fertilizer is above the ground, it's on the soil surface, we never see plant roots, the feeder roots, those little white roots that you see on the plant, they are never above the soil. I liken them to how a bleacher is. A bleacher, them not like sun. So even in the middle of the day when they're gone out, they're covering up with umbrella and long sleeve and all that. They do not want the sun to catch them. So if the fertilizer is on the soil surface, the plant's roots not going up there to get it. They're going down into the ground. So ideally, you want the fertilizer in the root zone of the plant. Now, your seed condition, only plant seeds that have sprouted. And I would say to you as a farmer, if you have less than three sprouts per seed potato, hold off on planting that. Because it's from those sprouts that develop the stolons, and which is what is going to give you your potatoes. So well, the farmer would have said, the average farmer said, the more stem you have is the more potato, pot, the potential you have for the potato to bear. So having only one will limit your production versus if you have two or three coming from one seed potato. Another planting practice is that what you want is that the majority of seed sprouts must be turned upwards. You don't want to turn the seed sprout down because that would make the plant have to use up a whole lot of energy that it could have spent going taller to the sky, going down into the ground and then curling back and pushing up out of the soil. In many cases, it might have actually used up all of the nutrients by the time it should sprout out. And similarly, if you plant it blind, a lot of times, because it's planted blind, it actually don't sprout. It actually does not turn in at all. So that is also another risk that you face. Now, in terms of the environmental conditions and on, you know, the potatoes can be produced on a wide variety of soils. But what you want to ensure is that it's well drained. So as I mentioned earlier, putting it, putting it, put in your drainage system ahead of time. And so I said, you know, your land prep has to start early. You know how your land stay. You know how your soil stay. If you know, say, one section of your land tend to hold the water longer, skip out a road there and put in a drain instead of a row of potatoes right there and lead the drain, uh, drain, use the drain to drain away the water from that particular area. Also, once the soil is loose, you end up getting better tuber development. Also, soils that are slightly acidic, you know, with a pH between five and seven, are more suitable for production. Land preparation. You start your land preparation early, as I mentioned, uh, uh, by August to September, in order to, to, to ensure that, you know, you, you, you get your soil properly 
broken down. Uh, ideally, you don't want to be on steep sloping lands. You know, flat or gently sloping is key. Um, you know, but a lot of us don't have that um, option. We have to use whatever land we have. However, you know, ensure that for the steep slope lands, you have your drainage systems in, once again, to control water washing through your farm. Okay, and then, you know, definitely avoid lands that are easily waterlogged and make sure you're putting in a drainage system because the waterlogged lands will rot your potatoes. Okay, in terms of your seeds, typical large seed for, large seed for farmers would be a 35, 55 mm seed. These may need to be bit or cut. And in cutting them, you need to ensure that you use a clean, sharp knife or scalpel. And you dip it in like a, after each cut um, in each potato, you dip it in a 1% beet solution. And this is because the potato itself, as much as they are screened and tested for any potential disease presence, some may slip through the cracks and have a disease. So you don't want to be bitting and spreading the disease from one potato to another. However, at the later part of the year, you might have the small seeds that are 25, 35 mm. These would not need to be bit. These could be planted whole. A typical bag will come as a 25 kilogram bag, which is 55 pounds. And, you know, on delivery, we advise that you remove the potatoes from the bags and actually spread them out in a cool, dry place where you have air circulating for them to breathe because the potatoes are still alive. So they need to breathe. And what will happen a lot of times if you leave them stacked one on the other, they start to sweat and then they start to break down and rot. Approximately three to 320 seeds are found in each bag, uh, depending on which of the presentations that you have, whether it's a large seed or the small seeds. We also recommend for those farmers who would buy the big seeds and bit, and even for the small seeds as well, that you can look at our Caribbean chemicals, we make our dip, and we have different options, different dip options to suit your particular pocket. And, you know, the options would include, however, like our, a fungicide, like our Acrobat, um, biostimulants and fertilizers, such as cytokine, green stem, and soligrow, and an insecticide, such as our diazinon. Now, Allow the seeds before plant to sprout before planting, and this is very important. And you can use our dip program for to stimulate increased sprouting and faster sprouting and faster growth. Remove the sprouts that may have developed prematurely. So, for example, you're not looking to plant in another say two weeks. But you buy your potatoes and the sprouts growing through the bags and long, like all three, four, five inches long. You can remove those sprouts and allow the plant to send up new, younger, more vigorous sprouts. Because a lot of those older sprouts, they may have been damaged or infected or affected and they're not going to grow as well as they should. Now, approximately 12 to 15 bags can plant an acre. But it can be more and it can be less depending on your land preparation. So in some cases, some farmers use tractors, some use um, fork and hoe in order to do their land preparation. And in some of those cases you now, rows might be closer to each other or further apart. So it varies based on your, your land preparation. Your yield range, Will, or will be or should be typically between, say, 15,700 to 26,900 kilograms per hectare, or about 14 to 24,000 pounds per acre. And the yield ratio that is a, a, a target, you know, acceptable would be 12 to 1 or, you know, up to 15 to 1. But I said to farmers, aim for 
over that 15 to 1. And at that ratio, over 15 to 1, is when you'll really see your, 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 you will see your production um, returns being in that place where you just say, yes, I have a big money for going down to the bank with tomorrow. And this is largely because, you know, the cost of fertilizer, the cost of your land prep, the cost of your planting material, everything adds up. And with those costs, you need to ensure that you can cover them and earn a nice set of profit. You know, a lot of unforeseen things might have might occur, which you need to ensure that you're maximizing that production. All right, so we look at some of the pests of potato. And right here, what we see now are aphids. Now, aphids are relatively easy to control and very easy to see. So they are soft body insects, which are just about an inch, just about an inch long, um, you know, at fully mature. What they do is actually pierce and suck the plant sap. And this will usually cause the plant to wither, wrinkle. Usually what you'll see is large colonies on the undersides of the leaves and the, the typically attack those younger leaves that come up at what you would call the terminal end of the plant. So those last very young succulent leaves. And then commonly you will see them with ants. And what the ants actually do, they have a symbiotic relationship, essentially. They, they work with the aphids. They offer protect, pro protection for the aphids. You know, they look after them, they help even move them from one place to the next. In return for the byproducts of the aphids feeding action, which what they give off is something called honeydew. They give off the honeydew and, and take that, feed it to fungus that they grow and consume. So it's a, it's a very, very good relationship that they have. So I tell a lot of farmers at a time, if you have aphids issue, once you get the, the ants under control, typically as well, you'll see the aphids disappear. However, aphids are pretty easy to control as we have a number of solutions for that, which would include our caratrax, our diazinon, our caprid, definite, and carbaryl. You know, but definitely our old faithful caprid is a one shot, half teaspoon to one teaspoon will control that issue. Next up, we have thrips. Now, a lot of farmers, you know, they, 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 they see thrips in action, but think it is white flies and mix up both because they are both very small and both feed aggressively on plants as well and have that a similar kind of um, behavior in terms of, you know, staying on the underside of leaves and flying once they are disturbed. Now, what they do is that they actually scrape the leaf surface and suck on the cell sap. So similar to how the aphids would feed on the sap, these pests also feed on the sap. However, treatment for thrips would include caprid as well as cure. And you know, another product that we have that we have in our arsenal that we have found does provide some amount of control for thrips, includes also uh, our indica. Okay, this pest now is the potato flea beetle. Uh, the flea beetle itself is another very, very, very difficult pest to control if it has infested your field. And the reason being for this pest now being a difficult one to control is that typically it will be hiding out in the soil or under the, 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 the leaf litter on the ground or 
in the foliage. So you won't really see them very active, but they would be there traveling around and feeding. Now, they have well-developed hind legs, which allows them to jump, like kind of like how fleas are able to jump far distances. And what they do now is that they, as well as their larvae, damage leaves and the tubers of leaves and the tubers of the plants. The adults themselves feed on the leaves of the plant and they leave holes, which looks like small shot wounds and the larvae themselves tunnel through are bore into the roots and the tubers, and what they will look, do is leave trails through them. Now, the treatment of the flea beetle includes diazinon, caratrax, definite, and carbon. Each of these product, products can be used in rotation at different times. So like you can start with the diazinon, rotate through to Caratrax and to Carbaryl and to Definite. The main thing here though, is that if you can keep the adults under control or limit the adults activity, then you definitely won't have issues with the larvae, which is one of the, 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 the larvae um, with their damage that they do to your tubers, you know, that would reduce your marketability. The next pest that you would encounter is spider mites. Now, mites themselves have eight legs and an oval body. So what you're seeing on the image here is the adults and the younger mites themselves um, actively feeding and, 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 and living their lives on the leaf of a plant. But what they do is feed on the leaves. And what you'll see is the leaves actually start to get wrinkled and then have this kind of bronzish color to it. And that is, that, that is typically what you'd see in terms of the mite damage. You can't see them. So this image is, is actually um, sized up for you to be able to see them. You'd actually need a magnifying glass to see the mites. Now, for the mites themselves, a lot of times by the time you start to see their damage, their population is expanding exponentially because they breed very fast and mature very fast as well. And as such, they can overtake a field within two weeks if they are not controlled properly. And this is one of the major pests that actually affect and limit potato production each year. Treatment recommended for spider mites includes our Nisaron and our Cure. So Nisaron can be used by, sorry, Cure can be used by itself, likewise Nisaron. However, we have found over the years that Nisaron combined with Cure provides excellent control of mites. So what will happen is that cure would typically control the adult and the later instars of the mites, and the Nisaron now would control the early instars and the eggs. So the, 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 what would happen is that the Nisaron actually makes the eggs of the, the mites be sterile. So when they mate and lay the eggs, those eggs would be sterile, so they would not hatch and develop into mites. Next up, we have white flies. And now white flies is everybody's worst pest. And you know, because of how active they are in the environment and the fact that they can feed on multiple different plants means that they are also very difficult to control. And what they are soft-bodied winged insects, you know, related to aphids and mealybugs. And what you'll often see them in is large clusters on the underside of the eaves. And what they do is 
suck the plant's juices from the plant. And typically, too, if you have um, the, the, the waste product, the honeydew, which is the waste product left by white flies, you know, if it if it is if the populations are high enough, what you'll actually start to see is fungal diseases actually start to form on the leaves. And what you'll see is like a little black looking uh, fungus, sticky looking fungus um, that actually starts to develop on the leaves. What will also happen is that leaves will wilt, they'll turn pale or yellow, and then the plant growth would also be stunted. In treating white flies, recommendations include our caprid, cure, and definite. As I mentioned earlier, each would be used in rotation, one into the next, into the next. Okay, so the white grub. The white grub is one of those pests that, you know, can do a whole lot of damage to your crop without you even knowing it. I've had at least three such incidents with farmers who have planted um, Irish potatoes and had white grub infestation and they did not know about it until they started to harvest their potatoes. In one case, over 70% of the harvested potatoes was damaged by the white grub. And in each of those cases, as I mentioned earlier about that land preparation, early land preparation, those areas were horridly cleared of whether it be trees and debris, and then was not plowed and allowed to rest fallow and bedded after before planting. They really rushed into planting. And the white grub itself, they like very cool areas that are damp. They feed also on, you know, dead wood or dead board and dead lumber, um, dead trees, I should say, or vegetative material, matter. And that would tell you then that, you know, if you have an area that was overgrown and you just hurry up and clearing it to try and plant potatoes, you might have white grubs in that area. Now, what you see typically is a large, very plump grub that has a grayish white body with a brown head. Typically, when it is not feeding, you will see it curled into a seed just the way you see it looks in this image. And what they do is feed on the tubers. Now, the damage to the tubers. What you'll see is that you have large, very shallow, irregular, and ridged gouges or tunnels. And the gouges are usually a quarter to half inch deep running along the surface of the tuber. And I tell people that I think sometimes the white grub is a very spiteful pest because what they do is typically target your largest, most attractive tubers and leave the small wishy-wishy ones. So advice to you now on ensuring that you have your treatment for white grub. If it is that, and, and, and the way I suggested is, if you are unsure of your land, if you really rushed your production, your land preparation, and you're rushing into your production, at about week seven, just do a random walk through your plot and just shift the dirt away from around the roots of your potatoes as they're developing and just check and see if you see any of them in there. Or if you know you had issues with white grubs in the past, you ensure that you do a treatment for that. And that treatment would include your drenching with either diazinon or Caratrats. Either one of these products should be able to provide the control that you need for white grubs. And uh, what, uh, what I'd also say to you as well, farmers, is that if, 
if it is that 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 you you had white grub incidents before, ensure that you plow your land. Once you plow it and turn over the soil, the garlin and the blackbird and all of those birds, they will come in and start to feed on the grub itself. And the grub itself doesn't even like sunlight. So once it is exposed to the, the heat of the sun, a lot of times they stress out, they get stressed out and they actually just die from the exhaustion or from the heat itself. Now, diseases of potato, and there are two major diseases of potato that we'll be looking at. One is late blight. And typically, a potato farmer would say to you, boss, my leaf, them burning. Once you have that occurring, usually you start to run into problems once you see the burning occur. So like for this image, once you are at this stage, you're starting to run into serious troubles with your potatoes because it's very difficult to halt that kind of burning and then have the new growth of leaves come in healthy. What you'll typically see is some water soaked spots on the lower leaves or the older leaves. The spots start out kind of pale green, so it would have a, a, a lighter color than the leaf color itself. And then what you'll start to see is that you start to see some irregular spots so they don't have a definitive shape on the upper side of the leaf. So it starts from the underside and then you start to see it on the upper side. Usually near the edges are the tips of the leaf. So it won't start in the middle. You'll see the, the tip of the leaf start to burn on the edges around the sides. The spots turn brown to a purplish black and they have a, a, a velvety with a pale green border on the underside of the leaf. The spots will also, uh, may also appear though on the younger leaves at the top of the plant. And what they look is like they'll have this kind of a, a watery, water soaked look. Non, you'll see non concentric rings uh, or a defined border around the necrotic spots. And you know, in, in, in humid, wet conditions, you might see a fuzzy ring of mold around the spot on the underside of the leaf. So you might see like a fuzzy mold looking thing developed on the underside of the leaf in the, if, if the conditions are very moist and you have rain falling and high humidity. The leaves will typically shrivel, turn brown and die. And this disease spreads very, very rapidly. Now you can, and, and, I tell, and for each potato farmer here, if you're serious about what you're doing, do not make two days pass and you don't visit your potato field. It is very important each day to every other day at the most, visit the field and do a scouting. Because a disease like this one, Within a week, it can take over an entire field without proper treatment and control. So do not take it lightly. In terms of treatment options, we have including our carbendazim, acrobat, carb uh, topsin, zampro, and belis. Now, a very good combination that can be done would be like a mancozeb with a carbendazim. And this is because you'd have what mancozeb would be acting as a protectant and the carbendazim would give you your systemic treatment. Acrobat as well would give you both the contact and the systemic control, likewise Zampro. And then for Topsin, you'll get your systemic control as well. Each of these products can be used either individually or in your cocktail treatments or in combinations depending on what the issues are that you're trying to treat. Now, early blight. And typically early blight is the, 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 the second, or uh, what would be the, the disease that you'd encounter later in the crop life. 
So late blight typically occurs earlier in the first, say, six weeks. Early blight occurs in the latter stages after, say, week five, six, onwards to the end of your crop. Now, typically, the symptoms appear in the older, more mature leaves near the base of the plant. So it has that in, 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 in that, that would be similar to how late blight occurs. And what you'd start to see is like one or two spots per leaf, about a quarter to a half inch in diameter. And the spots would have like a tan center, tan colored center with concentric rings and yellow halos around the edges. So that concentric rings is that when you look at the, 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 the spot itself, you would see some little lines running through that brown spot. And each line would have a bigger line or another line just outside of that one, and it keeps on going and getting bigger and bigger. Our treatment for early blight would be our bellies. Now, my, our recommendation as part of our spray program would tell you to use bellies in or at about week six or week seven, which is typically when you start to see early blight issues. So we actually recommend that you use bellies at around that time or just before then um, to help prevent the, the, the possibility that you would get an early blight infection in your crop. And once again, you see with for this for this um, image now, you actually can see that that kind of concentric rings. But this picture is zoomed up much more. You have you get to see that yellow, the yellow halo and the, um, coloration around the, the infection. And for this disease, though, it actually spreads slowly. And what you'll actually see is that the spots actually merge one into the other until the leaf drops, dies and drops off. It spreads slowly through the field, yes, but it's still not a disease for you to take lightly. Because once it has spread and started to infect the plants, what it actually does is do a large portion of its damage underground to the tubers which you cannot see until you harvest them. A lot of times we harvest potatoes and you, know, you dig up the potato and you, as you dig it up and hold it to your hand, it just breaks in your hand or it, 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 your hand just sink into the potato itself and you get this very foul odor that is largely due to the effects of the early blight infestation. Now, a, co a comparison picture here. The image on the left is uh, your early blight, where you can see the concentric rings with the halo. And on the right, you can see the late blight. If you look closely, you can actually start to see the little fuzz of mold growing on the leaf itself, at the infected point of the leaf. So both of them start from the base of the plant. What you get though with early blights is a target shape. So it looks kind of like a bullseye. It also forms a color around the stem. It would appear dry. So when you touch it, when you look at it, it looks dry. And then the leaves will turn yellow and drop. And it also spreads slowly. For late blight, what you actually see now are irregular shaped spots. They appear water soap. You will see the fuzzy mold, the ring of mold appearing. The leaves will turn purplish black and then drop off. And then this one spreads very rapidly. Now, some recommendations in terms of your crop care. Contact us or your ag chem, whether it be a sales rep or your product development agronomist, and get a crop care guide, the weekly crop care guide. You know, each, you know, every so ever so often we up Date these crop care guides because we are continuously doing work with our products and the newer products and fine tuning, you know, 
our, our spray guides based on the issues that are occurring. So if you had a spray guide from two years ago, I can guarantee you it's not the same one that we're using now. So we update these things regularly. Weekly applications must contain fungicides, insecticides, nutrients, and then adjuvant. The adjuvant is what we typically call a sticker. So like our new film P, our breakthrough, or our exit, those are adjuvants. Reason being for these is that you want to prevent fungal infections, prevent insect outbreaks, insect pest outbreaks. You want to provide the plant with as much nutrients as possible because a healthier plant with more nutrients will always give you a higher production. And you don't want if rainfall during the rainy period now that the chemical you spend so much money buying wash off. So you use an adjuvant to make sure it stick and stays. Also note, at the soap and all of these other things that some, some people are using, though they are not adjuvants. The adjuvants are stickers or are, once again, exit, breakthrough, new film P, and spreader sticker, all supplied by Caribbean Chemicals Jamaica. Observe for pests and diseases daily. If you really don't have the time to do it every day, don't make every other day pass. Because for a disease such as late blight, if it gets away in your field, you might not have the chance to correct that issue. A copper-based fungicide is also recommended in the early crop life. I suggest typically, and the, 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 the crop care guide would also suggest it at about day 13, 14 after the plant sprouted above ground. And one more time within a month after that first application. The reason being is that the copper based fungicide will also give you protection against bacterial diseases, such as your bacterial wilt and those kinds of stuff. Typically, those bacterial infections that have taken root hold of your plant early in its life, when it's still very tender, when it's still you know, fighting to cope with the environment that you take it and put it in, but they don't start manifest itself, the disease don't start show itself till probably a month and a half, two months after that, you start to see your plants just wilt down. And for like, Bacterial wilt, it spreads very easily in wet time and it will spread right through your field as long as the water running and washing it down the field, down through the field, it will spread through the field quickly. Now, in terms of fertilizer recommendations, typically two applications of fertilizer are done, once at planting and repeated at molding, which is at about three to five weeks based on um, after planting, based on how quickly your plants develop. So at planting, we have two options from our two fertilizer lines, Elixir and Abodam. The Elixir, six
Hi, good afternoon. We are having some technical difficult difficulties. The light just went, so Dennis is trying to rejoin. Hi, right, Patrick, can you share your screen? I'm going to give you a call. Hi everyone, it seems as if we're just having some technical difficulties all over, I got kicked out of the office. So um, I'm trying to get in from my computer. So if you have any questions, can you please type it in the chat in the meantime, please? Okay, everyone. So I'm um, just deciding that we will just end the session. If you have any questions, I'm going to type the WhatsApp number again in the chat. So you can call us or text us. There you go. I just put the WhatsApp number in the chat. So if you have any questions, we're so sorry about what happened today. Um, but we will just end the session right here. Thank you. In addition to that, you may join us tomorrow morning on our radio program, where we will continue to speak about Irish potato. And tomorrow we'll be speaking about nutrition and successes. There also, you can always call with your questions. Thanks again.